Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Um, this is my final sermon on the great ends of the church. Last week I spoke about the promotion of social righteousness, but in some ways I talked around it, discussing some cultural factors that are at play in our society, factors that may make living our Christian life in 2023 a bit fraught. But if I'm lucky, you remember my main point, which was that our righteousness, our orientation toward God, is closely related to our sense of justice, which is our orientation toward loving our neighbor. The church sometimes also has a fraught relationship with culture in general. We view the larger culture as somehow threatening to our faith. We wall ourselves off from it. And sometimes those are appropriate reactions. At other times, perhaps we completely surrender to it. That's not usually appropriate, but some interaction with culture is. I like rock and roll, but I'm not living my life according to the values I hear in rock songs. In 1910, when the great ends of the church were added to our Presbyterian Book of Order, Christians of that progressive era had a far more confident stance toward culture. They were going to change it. Their conviction was that teaching and living according to the mandates of the gospel would lead to the transformation of the society in which they lived. Christian believers who participated in the temperance movements, the suffrage movements, and the anti-slavery movements generally understood themselves to have a sanctifying role in relationship to the culture at large. I want to salute this noble and optimistic vision. Hindsight is 2020, so we know that women's suffrage and anti-slavery went pretty well. Prohibition of alcohol, not so much. But their hearts were in the right place, and they brought their faith into their lives. That is commendable, and we should do it too. Part of this is listening to the voices of people who've lived different lives so that we might learn from them. For the rest of this sermon, I want us to listen to three very distinct voices. We are going to start with the prophet Isaiah from some 2,500 years ago. In a very real sense, we are hearing the voice of God through the prophet. This is almost entirely a first-person chapter where God is the speaker through Isaiah. Shout it aloud! Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. God says, declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if a nation that does as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free. To break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If, you do away with the yoke of oppression, and with the pointing finger 
and malicious talk. And if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking my Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it not by going your own way and not by speaking as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob. Four, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen, my friends. All right. That was voice number one. The second voice I want us to listen to is that of the famous Helen Keller. Um, if nobody's ever heard, some, some of you may not have heard of Helen Keller. She's a uh, a woman in the 19th century who was born, uh, not born, but became deaf and blind and yet um, learned to communicate and became quite famous. I've excerpted this from a sermon by Reverend Marianne Grano. Many people do not realize that Helen Keller was not born blind and deaf. Indeed, at six months old, she was able to say howdy when still a baby. She said the word tea quite clearly. It was after a fever at 19 months of age that she was left without hearing or sight, and at that point began to forget all the words she had learned. Only one word remained, Helen writes. It was the word water, and I continued to make a sound for that word after all other speech was lost. After losing her sight and hearing, the toddler Helen became very frustrated. What was most frustrating to her was not so much the loss of the senses themselves, but the loss of the ability to communicate her thoughts and desires. She wrote in her autobiography, I moved my lips and gesticulated without result. I felt as if invisible hands were holding me and I made frantic efforts to free myself. Have you ever been at sea in a dense fog when it seemed as if a tangible white darkness shut you in and the great ship, tense and anxious, groped her way toward the shore with plummet and sounding line and you waited with beating heart for something to happen? I was like that, said Helen, before my education began. I was, only I was without compass or sounding line and I had no way of knowing how near the harbor was. Light! Give me light! wordless cry of my soul. One of the most difficult of human conditions is to be voiceless. In my observation, even the loss of mobility is less frustrating, less crushing to the human spirit than losing the power to communicate. Marianne Grano continues, I think of a woman with brain cancer I knew. She had been a high school chemistry teacher, was very intelligent, a well-read person. What most was most frustrating to her in the final months of her earthly life was that the cancer had attacked the part of her brain that controlled speech. In some ways, I think this was worse for her than the knowledge she was going to die. Because when you cannot communicate with another, it is as if you are alone. No one knows what is happening to you, what you feel, how you hurt. And it is easy to believe that no one cares. Why do babies cry? Why do dogs bark? Why do children shout so much? Because no one understands them. 
because they are voiceless. The promotion of social righteousness, one of the great ends of the church, might at first blush seem to be a call to be politically active, and that's exactly what it is. We listen to the voiceless. We love them. We help them. End of quote from Reverend Grano, and I thank her for her good words. The third voice I want us to hear is from a PCUSA pastor I'll call Jack. This is someone I know personally. After graduating from seminary, he pastored one church and then had to go on disability for mental health issues. I'm really glad that we live in a stigma-free community where we know that mental illness like Jack's is just as real and affecting as Helen Keller's deafness and blindness. Jack is pretty active on social media and his anger about his situation comes through. Recently, he went on a rant about various pull yourself up by your own bootstrap stories that he, he hears. He isn't at all against the idea of hard work and success. He's against people not acknowledging the advantages they started with. He joked about one such story this week. Someone was being lauded that, quote, he worked hard and made sacrifices to assemble a property empire that provided him with $100,000 passive income a month. Well, that sounds pretty good. But here's the rest of the story. He did all this while being his daddy's special little guy and earning $100,000 a year at his family's property ownership company and living rent-free in the pool house. If that's your situation, it's a little cruel to say to people without those advantages, if I can do it, so can you. <laughs> Jack also has had three student loans for nine years. The original principal total about $49,000. He pays interest every month, but the principal is actually going up on all three. After all those payments, he now owes $53,000. I didn't know how student loans work. I thought they were like mortgages or car loans. Not so. With a mortgage at closing, you know exactly what you will pay back. Interest is calculated monthly. Extra payments pay down principal. If you get into trouble, you can get out of it through bankruptcy. Student loans don't work that way. Interest is compounded daily. Extra payments go toward future payments, not to pay down principal. If you don't make a monthly payment because you're paid up in advance, your interest is still calculated daily. You can't get out of these student loans through bankruptcy. If that doesn't qualify as usury, I don't know what does. I'm glad President Biden wants to offer student loan forgiveness to people like Jack, but I would much rather our government reform this corrupt system that cripples people who don't go directly from college into a very high paying job. And God forbid they should get sick like Jack. Couldn't Jack just get a part-time job to earn extra money? No, he can't. I don't know all the details, but he's on disability from the PCUSA and in the eyes of the government. His disability provides health insurance for him, his wife, and their two children. He can't earn extra income without putting that at risk. If I understand correctly, he can't really add to his income at all because one of his illness kicks in again. Going on, suppose he took a retail job and then got sick again, right? Going on disability from that might look very different from going on disability as a PCUSA pastor. He can't even try it out to test his capabilities without putting his family's health and security at risk. It's an ongoing and a timeless problem, what Isaiah calls the yoke of oppression. And the Lord says, is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Can we as Christians hear the voice of the voiceless? Can we as a nation? Can we value people because they are endowed with certain unalienable rights by their creator? Or do we only look at the bottom line? Is monetary profit actually our God? Can we view people like Helen Keller and Jack as assets rather than liabilities? God does. 
perhaps we can too. Our forebears in 1910 thought we could, that our faith could be a positive force in this world. Maybe it can. May it be so. Amen.